Well, it's about 2.30 in the afternoon on a Sunday, and I'm still drinking coffee. <laughs> I'll try not to drink it in your ear, though. But if I do, I'll mute it out in uh, post-production or whatever. So what we have here are, are just some lights that I've been playing with. These are going to be um, my selections, my choices for the saucer section. Uh, this is part of the process. This is what I've been working on lately. I've, you know, uh, I've been struggling to find the time to get into this project. The last video I posted was close to two weeks ago. And just, you know, normal life takes priority, of course, working and sleeping and feeding myself. Uh, so I'm finding the time that I have to actually do any work on this model is limited. Plus a lot of the work that I'm doing is very tedious and still experimental. So there hasn't been a lot to do a video about, but, um, I will, oh, just adjusting my chair here, I will talk about what I have managed to accomplish so far. So let's start with the lights here. You can see an arrangement of LEDs on my board. Uh, my, let me just plug this in real quick and we will review some of my choices and options and whatnot. So first and foremost, the red and green were pretty easy. Uh, these are 1.8 millimeter red and green. These are going to be for the side markers. Uh, the red goes on the port side, the green on the starboard side. They will flash, of course, uh, once I've written the code for that and put it onto the chip. It probably doesn't look very red in the video. It looks more orange, doesn't it? But that is a red. It's actually a very bright red. Um, so what I'm running here is a 5 volt, 2 amp power supply directly into the board. And I've got a 100 ohm resistor going to these lights. These That's nominal for these lights. These are uh, 20 milliamp, I believe. Almost all the LEDs that I picked out were, were 20. There are a few exceptions like this a rectangular shaped amber is a 30 milliamp. But for the most part, 20 mil. This one, I'm not even sure. I bought this at my local electronics shop. His inventory is very limited. I didn't get a data sheet with this, so I don't even know what these are. I could probably take a, my measurement tool and figure it out. But So at 5 volts, 100, 100 ohm resistor, I found most of the parts that I bought were that. Once I calculated out the resistance necessary to run these at nominal, they were usually 100 ohm resistors that I needed almost every time. There were a few exceptions. I think I had a couple of 180 ohm. Um, but these here, the, the resistors that you see are all 100 ohm resistors. Anyway. My red, my green, these are easy choices to make. I only bought, so I bought, I think, five of these and three of these. So that should be more than enough. I only need two of them, two of each. And here are my choices for my ambers. The ambers are for the thrusters of the ship. Uh, and they're located in various places. Uh, right now I'm working on the saucer section, so there are four different places where the saucer section needs one of these one of these choices for amber lights. And I bought a selection of ambers because I didn't know how I wanted to approach it. The complication is in the saucer section, and I'll move my camera momentarily and, and we'll take a look. The complication is that there are lights on the top of the saucer, on the bottom of the saucer, and lights four of them on the side of the saucer. And the uh, thrusters are unique in that they have those ports out the side, not just the top and the bottom, but out the side. So the camera is probably not picking this up very well, but this is a very orange, a very fire orange. This one is brighter, but it's the same hue. Um, actually, let me pull this resistor out. Because right now I'm that rectangular one, I'm actually overdriving it with another resistor. Let's pull that out of there. Okay. So this nominal is putting out is, is consuming 30 milliamps of power. This one here is consuming 20, but it's quite a bit brighter. Uh, I'm assuming just because the uh, the area inside there is smaller. This one is larger, so there's a lot more area to diffuse the light so it appears dimmer. Even though it is actually consuming more power, it does appear dimmer because there's more area to light up. 
These here are much more on the yellow side. They're close to the same hue. I think they might be if this one wasn't a clear bulb. This one here is uh, frosted, so I think it gives it a much more even light distribution on the inside, and it does affect the hue a little bit depending on your viewing angle. But just looking at a head on, which I don't want to do for too long because this is actually pretty bright, um, they do appear to be the same hue. So my choice is going to be, do I want a more orange color or a more yellow color for my thrusters? And I'm leaning, never mind the shapes, and because this rectangular one is going to be so much easier to work with when it comes to fitting into the actual saucer. But I don't want to base my decision on that. What I want to do is decide what color I want out of those maneuvering thrusters. And when I think about it, I, I'm i assuming that maneuvering thrusters are essentially rockets. They're similar to what we would use in today's day and age with today's technology for maneuvering a spacecraft around. Now, in some cases for small movements, we're just simply in small craft. We just simply use uh, gases I'm not sure what gas exactly, but let's just pretend oxygen, for example. They're not burning the oxygen when they're making little adjustments in their craft. They're just venting oxygen in a direction, in the opposite direction of the way they want to move their craft, and that's how they maneuver around. But I think for a vessel as large as the Enterprise, you could imagine that it might be more of a rocket power system that they're using to gently maneuver their ship around. So, yellow or orange. And I'm leaning towards the orange because to me that better represents rocket fire over the yellow. The yellow is more of a, um, uh, I don't know, it just doesn't seem as energetic or dramatic maybe is the right word. I think the orange is the direction I'm leaning, which is to my advantage because as I mentioned, this rectangular shaped LED is going to be a lot easier to work with, I think, in the saucer section for placing them and getting light out of the holes that are available. I would have. Now, originally, the reason I, I bought so many is because uh, I thought I might put one of the smaller bulbs against the holes, the top and the, the, the top and the bottom hole in the saucer section, and then use the light from this outside the square holes on the side. But just in playing around, there's just so little room in there. There didn't seem to be enough room to mount these, so I would need two of them per, per thruster compartment. I would need one on the bottom, one on the top, pointing out the hole, and then at least one sandwich between them. And by the time you factor in the height of the bulb itself, plus the leads, it just didn't, it's gonna be a lot of work trying to orchestrate those in there, and I, I wanna try to avoid those work. Besides, I wasn't able to get even light if I did it that way. Unless, like I said, I could overdrive these, I could over resist these and try to get them a little closer in uh, invisible appearance. And that may work, but again, that would be three different bulbs occupying a small little compartment and maneuvering them in there, wiring them, making sure they don't short against each other. It's a lot of extra work. And in my tests, I came to realize that maybe one of these rectangular ones might be sufficient. And the advantage is, one of the things that I don't want to have happen in the, just, just the visible appearance, is to look into those holes and say, oh, hey, look, there's a bulb. I don't want that filament to be visible. And I don't want there to be a, like a bulb. Like I don't, want, I don't want to be able to see a bulb inside there. So I think this might be the better option. Uh, and, and I don't know if I'd be able to demonstrate that on camera because it was a pain in the butt just trying to wire it without gluing these down or tacking these down, kind of hold this in place, keep my wires, my, my leads separate so that they don't short out and yet still move the saucer section around so I could peek through all the holes and see what was going on inside there. Uh, trying to do all that while still getting it on camera, that would be a real nuisance. You'd probably hear me cussing and fussing all over the camera. So I may not show that, but just uh, <laughs> just let me say that it was a bit of a nuisance. So Yeah, so these are the lights that I think I'm not going to use these yellows. And again, you're not seeing it so much on camera, but 
these orange really are quite orange. And that red really is quite red. I don't know if I can find an angle that the camera's a little happier with, but not really. They almost all look white. Hey, there's a green bulb that's white, and there's a red bulb that's white. Anyway, yeah, I'm going to move the camera here. Some of the things that I want to discuss are uh, the progress I've made so far in the saucer section, which is minimal, but I've started uh, putting down my compartments, and I've been doing some tests with that. Um, and more than anything, I've been struggling to find a wiring solution that I was happy with. Uh, I'd like to describe the process I went through there and the choices that I made and why. And finally, um, light blocking and some of the some of the little lessons learned in my light blocking attempts here. So let me move the camera and uh, we'll progress with some of those. Oh, and I also wanted to go through my electronics inventory. I meant to do it in my last video. I was already pushing 40, 45 minutes. And I thought, you know, we'll do it in the next video and I haven't done a next video yet. So I'd like to go through some of those and uh, again, explain some of the choices I made and, and why. I ordered more inventory than I needed uh, because I wanted to have more. I didn't want to have less <laughs> if it came down to needing something. I didn't want to have to place another order. So anyway, we'll go through all that as well. All right, that'll do. Okay. Working on the saucer section. This is uh, <laughs> this is gonna take a while before I'm done the saucer, I think. Let's flip this over and have a look at what I've done so far. So, as you can see, gr two great big ugly areas. These are painted with a black enamel because I've been doing some light blocking tests. Let's get this closer to the camera. And I'll show you the compartments that I've laid down. So. In my last video, I believe it was, I described the shape of these little pieces that are representing the bulkheads between the cabins inside of here uh, that will separate the light groupings that I had planned to accomplish. So this area here is the fewer windows. There are four on the bottom and then two that I'll have to construct along the top once I have the window pieces in. And this is the first of the many windows sections. Uh, these compartments, I was doing some light testing on them already. That's why the paint is down. What I used was my Humbrol enamel paint to just get in there with a brush and uh, paint a little bit of the flat black enamel that I had, uh, mostly just for my testing. I had planned to just continue doing that all the way around, uh, but I've decided not to, and I'll explain why in a moment. What, what I encountered was a failure using the uh, the brush, and I'll get into that. One thing I have done is I've gone around the entire circumference and I've put down that polystyrene strip. I did end up buying the 1.5 mil by three quarters of a mil, and that's almost exactly right, but the 1.5 is just maybe a little bit too high. I do have a, a bit of an edge that I can grab onto there. I'm thinking maybe the 1.4, if there is such a thing, may have worked a little better, uh, but that's not a big deal because I've been able to take my sanding stick and just bring that edge down. One of the things that I did need to do, and uh, so if anybody else is following along and decides to go this road as well, is before you glue down that strip, make sure you just take a simple step to square off these edges. So this is the thin edge here, and I just took my, uh, I need to replace my blade here soon. I just took my X-Acto knife and scraped off that leading edge because there's sometimes there's a little bit of a flashing on the uh, on the edge there, and you want to take that off. You want to make sure it's square, and you find if you just drag the edge along, you'll curl off that little bit of flashing and it squares the edge nicely. Uh, so I did that around the circumference of the saucer section, with the exception of where the uh, the rec deck. Recreation deck, I'm guessing, but rec deck, I hear it called all the time. Uh, I left that open. I'm not sure. I haven't done any fitting tests with the actual rec deck yet, uh, so I don't know how that's going to work out, but I don't think I needed that little strip there. 
I, I figure if they didn't put down that edge, then I shouldn't either. Uh, so I did, I did trim those. I've begun cutting out the areas for my thrusters. So I've done all four of those. I just took, uh, I didn't use a tool for that, or not a power tool, I should say. I used a, a hand tool. I just have my little collection of hand files, little miniature hand files. Mastercraft from Canadian Tires is pretty cheap. I got it on sale. I, I think I paid under 10 bucks for that. And uh, they've been working quite well. So I just went in there. The little triangle shaped one just grinds that plastic away. It's real quick. And by the time I set up my power tool and, you know, for the noise that it makes and the dust that it throws all over the place, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to hand tool that. I got no problem with a little bit of manual labor. I did manage to do one of the, so I did the red side. That's my port side. Uh, this is where my uh, navigation, my red navigation flasher will go. Uh, I filed that down a little bit as well because I wanted to test a fit with the leads and, and just do a, a bend test and determine how hard it was going to be to uh, mount those in there. I don't think it's going to be very hard at all. So there's one of my LEDs. The shape of it, how am I going to show this? Let's get this little box back again. Let's see if we can get a zoom. May or not may not be able to see that. The shape of these originally was square on one end and slightly rounded on the other. And when I took that and tried to place it down against these holes, there's an inside hole and then an outside hole. And it almost wanted to fit into that outside hole nicely, uh, but not quite. So I rounded that shape down a little bit and I I found that I got it to sit in there just nicely so that I could actually sit by itself. And that 1.8 didn't need too much coaxing to sit right into the hole there. So my strategy was to poke this up from the inside. Now I didn't want the bulb poking through, like not right through, but just, I wanted it flush. It's a navigation light, and I'm thinking that, that that light shouldn't just shine straight up. Like, I don't want the, the light to be down inside the hole too far, where the only direction you're really seeing the intensity of the light is directly straight up. So I did want it to, to have a bit of a viewing angle, but I didn't want the bulb to poke right through the hole either. You know, I wanted just, just to barely be able to see the tip of that bulb. And I found to do that, I had to widen the inside of the hole just a little bit. So I used one of my uh, files there and I just lightly pushed it down inside the hole. I think it was the triangular shaped one again, or it may have been the circular one. And I just pushed it down in the, into the hole and I rotated it a little bit and it just bit off a bit of the inside of that so that I could sit the LED down inside there a little bit. And what I have now is I, I think this mounts really well. It's not exaggerated, the bulb sticking through that hole but yet it should give me a nice effect. I did test it, I, I lit it up and uh, I liked how that looked. I haven't done it with the green yet, but I, I'll get around to that. I'm kind of working my way around the circumference a little bit. Uh, I did also sand down a bit of the top of that hole. Reason being, again, you're not gonna be able to see this because the camera doesn't wanna focus. It's very picky about what it focuses on. Nope. So the way the way that works is that there's on the outside of these holes, there is a larger circumference raised circle like like, like where that the mounting for that bulb would be. And then there's a very thin one that rises just above that. And I sanded down the thinner of the two. Um, because I just didn't feel it was necessary. It was preventing my bulb from sticking out to, to where I wanted it to sit. And uh it almost just looks like flashing anyway, so it wasn't a big deal. I'm not going to cry over that. I sanded those right down. They're not consistent on all the different spots in the lighting around the ship anyway. So uh, I wasn't sure if it was part of the design or if it was just a little bit of flashing. I'm assuming it was part of the design, but again, I'm not going to worry about taking those down a bit. Um, now, in my light blocking, I wanted to share this with you because this was definitely a learning experience for me. 
I found that I was able to light block the inside of these compartments very nicely using that black enamel paint. And I was able to take one of my LEDs, place it down inside there, light it up. I put my, and it looked good, like just even covering it with my thumb, I was, I was not seeing light bleeding from compartment to compartment. So I was really happy with that. Uh, the enamel paint worked really well. It was just one single coat of the flat black and it prevented the, uh, it also sealed up. I didn't have to do any extra work to seal up between the, you know, on the edges of these compartments when I shoved them down in there because my edges weren't perfect. They were close, but not perfect, especially on the bottom and on the inside uh, edge here. There were little gaps here and there, but I found that enamel paint just, uh, it, it, it soaked into those gaps and it sealed them up perfectly. So I didn't have to worry too much about that. The problem that I encountered was taking the, the parts with the windows on them and then putting, mounting these over top. Uh, I put a little bit of tape to block the light along this inside edge. And the light blocking was almost there, but not quite. I also brushed some enamel onto the inside surface here. Um, and again, it worked really well, but these, this plastic, man, if it can grab the light anywhere, it's going to absorb it and that plastic is gonna glow. And where it was absorbing it, is on the insides of the windows. So the light was getting through the windows, but that white plastic inside there was grabbing the light and this whole section would just glow. Everything else was light blocked. That was the only place the light was getting into there. And uh, so I came to the conclusion that I was going to have to paint and I didn't want to do it, but I was going to have to paint the insides of these windows. And again, now here was where, where I made my mistake. I started to brush the enamel inside there and it went on very thick. I did try to mask off the outside surface first so that I wouldn't get paint and bleeding through. Uh, it did anyway because the edge of this window is right along these little fine details. This is your sensor bands. And uh, the light was, le or sorry, the paint was leaking out in there and it gave me a little ring of paint around those edges. When I pulled the masking off, uh, I found that paint had bled into the first and sometimes even the second of these sensor bands, the, the the tape, even though I pressed down really hard and tried to dig it into those grooves with my fingernail, it just, it wasn't sufficient. Um, not only that, because the tape was there, the paint had pooled a little bit at the bottom of these windows. So it created like a paint flashing on the edge. So I had a lot of cleanup to do there. And I was trying to, I was scraping it out with a toothpick because I didn't want to damage the plastic, but I wanted to get that paint flashing out of there. Um, and then I took a very soft cloth with some paint thinner and I was just trying to clean the paint up out of the sensor bands. And what I ended up doing is I, I realized that the, the thinner was not reacting well with the plastic. It was actually starting to, it almost seemed like it was heating the plastic and allowing it to melt and, and kind of soften up this detail. And I caught it pretty quickly. I realized, oh, oh this, this is not turning out well. So I had to clean that up. I decided to completely remove all of the enamel that I had put down on these parts. I painted two of them, no, sorry, three of them. This one was the worst. This is the first of the many windows section, this compartment that I've been playing with here. And uh, it was the one that I, I had been doing the most work with. So I did a little, bit of, a little bit of research and I found that this super clean Everybody claimed that it worked really well. It was fairly non-toxic. It was environmentally safe and that it would clean any kind of paint. And I thought, well, let's give it a shot. I went down to the Walmart at about eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. Um, and I bought that, I think it was about eight bucks for that little bottle. And it's true. I bought a little plastic container and I just threw all my parts in there that I wanted to clean up into that container. Uh, I dumped enough of that super clean, just enough to to submerge everything, although they started to float a little bit, but not so much that they wouldn't, you know, bury all the paint in there. So I threw all my parts in there. I let them sit for about three hours, I think it was. And the paint was visibly peeled right off. Like there were still traces here and there. Um, so at that point I was able to put my gloves on and get a little old toothbrush and I'll just scrub the rest off under my tap. There is still traces of black in here. And I think that's just because I was rubbing the black paint with a thinner 
so the thinner was actually melting the plastic and, and the paint actually got into the, the plastic itself. It was starting to bond. But I did have to take my X-Acto knife and rescribe these lines. I spent about an hour doing that just to make sure I had those lines back. It's not quite perfect. Um, I'll probably have to really pay attention to that as I'm going through, as I start putting some primer down. But my concern now is I'm not, I don't know how to get paint into these windows. I do have spray enamel. I have black that I had used on my car. I went while I was at Walmart last night. I picked up a white as well. It's a white enamel. So I'm going to do what everybody else seems to do. And I'm just going to put this down into a paint booth. And I'm going to coat the entire thing a couple of times because I'm going to use very light coats. I don't want to... I don't want to coat this stuff so that my paint is pooling anywhere. But I do need to get some spray in there. I'll probably lay these down flat. I'll spray these as well. So hopefully maybe that, if I do a couple of really light coats, I'll be able to get the insides of the windows. I'll do a, a layer, maybe two coats of the black and then two coats of the white. Very gentle coats though. Uh, and hopefully that will suffice for the light blocking. Because otherwise, I don't know how else to prevent the light from getting into these windows, getting into that plastic from there, absorbing and then glowing like, a, like I was, it was doing. And if it does do that, will my primer, because I'll probably use a couple of coats of primer, at least two coats of primer when I'm ready to paint all this up, um, two coats of primer and then at least two coats of the base color, the insignia white. So will that be enough? Like my primer is a gray and my base coat is a, a white, so it's a almost a gray, it's lighter, it's like a linen white color. The question is, will that be enough to light block? And I should almost test that first. And since this piece is already beat up, maybe this will be the test that I, or the part that I test with. Anyway, recovery. Recovery is a part of the game when you're doing modeling. And uh, I was a little discouraged for half a minute and I thought, you know what, let's just deal with it. And, do what I can to correct that. And I think the results aren't too bad. It's not going to be anything that you would notice unless you're looking for it. But of course, me being the builder, I will look for it and I'll know it's there. <laughs> It'll bug me forever. Anyway, so before I put down that coat of uh, black and white, the light blocking, I wanted to make sure I've taken all of the, I've done all the modifications that I wanted to do to this first. That's why I went ahead and, and ground out these areas. I don't think with, uh, with the marker lights, I'm going to need to ground too much or grind too much off of here, maybe just a little bit off the top so that the bottom of the saucer section will mate. Uh, because the wiring, the wiring solution that I've chosen, and I'll get into that right now, is not standard. I don't see anybody else doing it this way, but there are reasons that I've chosen to do this. Let me just uh, reach in here and grab my first couple of wiring solutions. So a lot of what I see other people recommending, and I understand why, and I would have liked to go this route had it been viable, is using magnet wire. Magnet wire is very thin. It holds its place, like you can bend it and it, it'll sit there. Uh, so it's very trustworthy that way. But for me, I only had the one color at my local shop. He didn't have various colors of magnet wire, uh, and it's a copper color. I found this stuff a real pain in the butt to strip and to test with. And being that there's only one color, when you do manage to strip it, it's copper on the inside, so you can't even tell when you've successfully stripped it or not. Plus, for me, once I got a lot of the parts wired, um, it would have been very difficult to distinguish positives from negatives. And then, of course, there's a lot of wiring that it may be positive or negative, but it's actually serving a different purpose. And uh, an example of that is, so I have eight different LEDs going to each of my uh, light sections, my crew compartment sections. And I wanted to be able to pair them up. I needed colors to do that. And I played around with maybe painting the magnet wire. It took extra time to do that. And in the end, the paint just kind of rubbed off anyway and it got all over everything. Uh, so that wasn't a very good solution. I had a tough time soldering with this stuff too. There are a couple of different kinds of magnet wire. I had to look this up. There is 
a variant of magnet wire that the soldering process itself will not burn through the insulation. So you may end up with that kind of magnet wire. I don't think I have that kind. I, I did seem to be able to get through the insulation by soldering, but it was a pain in the butt. It smokes, it's toxic, it's stinky. Um, I just wasn't liking this as a solution. Primarily, and the rest of it I could deal with, primarily I wanted different colored wires. I don't want to have, I'm doing a lot of lighting inside that saucer and inside the ship. If I'm lighting those compartments individually, that's a lot of wire. And keeping track of that wire is going to be a real pain in the butt if I don't have different colors to work with. So that was not my solution. My home electronics guy, or the electronics store down the, down the road here, he had this little roll. Now, this became intriguing. He had this little roll of 30-gauge wire. And this 30-gauge, I think it's eight different colors. Um, and I thought, well, maybe that's an option then. 30-gauge is very small. Uh, the insulation is not very thick, so this wire does not occupy a lot of space. And I think it could easily have been my solution, except for one thing. There was only eight colors. I needed more. I needed... 8 plus 2. I needed my, I want my positive and my negative to stand out. I want to use standard red and black for positive and negative, and then I need eight colors on top of that to distinguish between the lights in a group. Uh, so this would certainly be an option, and I still see this wire getting used um, for little one-offs, particularly when I'm, when I start wiring my circuit boards. I will use this because I'm using um, experimental prototype boards to house my components, uh, which means that I will need to wire uh, my components to each other. So this is probably the wire that I will use for that. So this will be useful. But I, unfortunately, I think, I mean, magnet wire is not cheap. And I, I could have gone online and bought a couple of different colors of magnet wire. But for the cost, that just wasn't viable for me. I, I, I need to start limiting the amount that I'm spending on this project now. And uh, so I didn't want to go with the magnet wire. This will get used, but again, it was just a little bit limited. So what I decided, I've been using jumper cables so often in my work here, just experimenting on my uh, breadboards. And I thought, well, you know what? They're ideal solutions. There's 10 colors. I have my positive and my negative color plus eight on top of that. That's perfect. They have sockets on the end. They're easily, they're plug and play. Uh, this is the ideal solution. The only drawback to these is that the insulation is as thick as it is. So these wires are cumbersome. In my first test, for example, I wanted to try to create a space to let my wires through from the, here, let me get my saucer out again. So when I've got my LED sitting down inside here, I need to run my wires up and over this bulkhead. Uh, I didn't want to cut through this because this is thicker. And uh, that might be structural support as well once I start gluing everything together. Uh, so the better option I thought would be to cut through that gap that exists. Where are we? Here. Am I on camera? So I had to cut through a little bit here just to get those wires through. And that's bare minimum amount that I need to squeeze both of those wires through, which I'm not, it's an option, so I'm not complaining. Uh, but those, those wires are pretty thick. Uh, the good thing about it is once, once they're in there, they're in there and I can bend them and play around with them. And there's, uh, there's, once they're stripped even, there's quite a bit of wire. They're easy to solder. So that became my solution. So I went and uh, ordered... I calculated how much I would need. This is enough for my saucer section, at least. Uh, I've got the mail, mail to mail. I've got another pack of mail to mail. I've got my female to female, female to female. Between these two, that's how I'm going to distinguish between my positive and my negative. Because you, with the two different colors. So, so let's see. Here's my. Here's a blue. Here's gonna. This is gonna be one of the compartments that get lit up. Uh, because they're both blue, how do I tell positive from negative? Well, I have one a male end and one a female end. And the way that uh, 
power flows, it, it flows actually through the negative and out the positive. So the female is my negative, my male is my positive. And I found these nifty little items. This is a male on one end, a female on the other end. So if I cut just the ends off, that gives me each pair that I need. So that's what I'm using for, uh, that's what I'm using for my wiring. And I think it's a good solution. I like it. It's going to be very colorful as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but it, that will help me distinguish A, my positives from my negatives. It, B, it gives me my red and black wires for actual power supply, positive and negative. And it gives me an assortment of eight other colors to use. And plus, they're already glued together. If I wanted to just rip a section off, I could just leave it that way um, and go ahead and mount it on the board. So what I did is I calculated how far I would need, how much, how much clearance I would need to get my light in there and how much additional wire I would need in order to still be able to reach with the rest of these. And I figured as long as I could clear the center section and reach to the other side a little bit, then I'm fine. So from any one of these, uh, this is, are these 10 centimeters or 15s or no, they're 20s even. These are 20 centimeters. So yeah, I got the 20 centimeter um, jumper cables and they'll reach, that's enough room. I didn't order them, but there's also, longer ones like substantially longer i could always you know i could connect them together and create 40 80 100 centimeters worth of uh, length but you can also buy really long ones as well so if i needed to reach down from my circuit board and then down through the neck through the ship and down into my base that's also a solution that's easy to implement and if i ever need to test i can plug it in if i'm finished my test i can unplug them it's a very very good solution for for my purposes so I'm, I'm happy with this. It may not be for everyone, uh, but for me, I'm happy. So that's the route that I've chosen to go for my wiring. Now I did manage to solder a group of eight of these so far. I do have eight that are ready to go. Um, and the soldering was actually not too bad. Uh, I found as long as I uh, put down a little bit of uh, Oh, what's that stuff called? My brain is dying here. Flux. <laughs> as long as I put a little bit of flux on the edges of my LEDs where my leads are um, and let the soldering iron heat up well enough first that uh, I was able to solder these on without any problem. And I just trimmed the end. I don't know if you can see it, but between the positive and the negative, I put a little teeny piece of uh, styrene strip. So that's where I'm gonna glue the, uh, that's how I'll glue the, the LED to the surface of the model itself. So yeah, that works for me. Uh, I'm gonna sit down here pretty quick and, and just get all the rest of them done in one big shot. I am right now, like, like I said before, I put down my light blocking. Uh, I wanna go ahead and finish the rest of these compartments get them glued in there. And then when I put down my light blocking, I'm, I'm painting everything all at once. I probably won't do these compartments because these are gonna be self-contained. They're, they're not gonna have an open area that I can get paint into. Um, so I'll do these separately. I'll make little compartments for these lights here as well and uh, work with that. I am concerned about getting overspray though. Uh, I will mask off the entire inside edge here uh, before I do any spray painting. It, it, the way I see it, um, preventative work is always easier than repair work. So I'll mask all that down. I'll probably lay some plastic down. I'll cut out a plastic bag, uh, a recycling bag or something like that. And uh, I'll mask the entire top surface off. And then when I lay that masking down, I'll just make sure that I'm, I'm preventing overspray. I don't want to get any discoloration along here at all. So I'll, I'll take care of that. I'll block, of course, all of these holes off here. I may cut this before I do any painting uh, so that when I do paint, uh, my paint, my light blocking is getting along the edge of these windows here. Um, 
Yeah. This is, this is almost ready for light blocking though. So once I get these compartments down, I've got another five cut right now. With each of those, by the way, this, this was <laughs> pretty tedious. If anybody does decide to go this route, be prepared. This is not easy. I mean, it's not hard, but it is tedious, very tedious. Each single one of these, I was cutting with my master piece, but I was over cutting a little bit. So this is a raw piece. You can see there's even there's a little edge sticking out here. I'm off camera. This is raw. What I do is I take my masterpiece <laughs> and I just hold it over top. I pinch it between my thumb and my forefinger and I start roughing, roughing the sanding down, just getting it closer to the original shape. And then even from there, one by one, I'm having to fit these in and test them. Fit it in, pull it out, sand it a little bit, fit it in, pull it out, and constantly putting on my window piece and testing. And I can tell if it's working, if it rocks back and forth too much, or if it rocks up and down too much, then I have a little, little more work to do. I also found that if I put my piece in close to where this natural gap is, I can have a look in there and see where it's, where it's touching. And that helped quite a bit. Um, my screensaver just kicked in. That means my camera is going to kick out pretty quick. Uh, one of the things my camera loves to do, and it ruins my video, it takes a lot of work to recover from this, is it, um, let me just reach over here. It, it only occupy, it'll only let me record two gigs worth of data and then the camera cuts off the video and then restarts it again. So I have a gap of about a second and a half um, <laughs> and it absolutely, they're hard to splice it. The end of it is like not properly closed or something. Uh, and I have a tough time rejoining them because, uh, my video editor seems to choke on them. So let me just, uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to restart this manually so we don't have that problem. Well, that was an adventure. Turns out I was also critically low on recording space. So I had to do some file system cleanup. Speaking of file system, two gig file limit. That's a FAT32, I would guess then. FAT32 file system. Um, on a top end Android device, I'm using my Samsung Galaxy cell phone as a recording device. So I'm guessing that the partition, the user partition must be FAT32 just to make it easier for people like me to plug it into their computer and just let it run and go. Anyway, that surprised me that I had a two gig file limit. Um, this is a saucer section. Where was I? I think I was talking about uh, cutting these pieces. So yeah, this is, uh, this is certainly the most tedious part of the work I have to do right now. And I'm looking forward to getting this out of the way. Um, because once these little compartments, these individual compartments are done, that should be the hardest work, or at least the most tedious work done uh, for almost probably the rest of the model. I'll still have other compartments that I need, that I need to build, but they're almost one-offs or small little collections of them. This one here, this is this is big. Uh, I have at least seven sections that require five. So let me have 35 of these teeny little pieces that I have to cut and fit. Um, you know, I'm cutting them against my master and then uh, comparing them and sending them down, but I'm having to individually place each one into the slot once it's filed down and individually put on the window portion, test whether it rocks, whether it's sitting properly. If it rocks back and forth this way, then I have some filing to do against the face of the piece. If I have some rocking up and down this way, then I have some piece, some filing to do along the top edge. Uh, I don't want to file too much at a time because I like to get it as close as possible uh, for light blocking. But even still, I don't expect that to be perfect. So even once all these pieces are in there, uh, I think my strategy is going to be when I am, when lights are all in here and I am ready to glue on these, uh, these side portions, what I'll probably do is 
run a little bead of some kind of a sealing, either silicone, and I did buy some silicone. This is clear, however. I'll need to either get some black silicone or down in my garage, I do have a gasket maker and that might work as well. And I'll just run a tiny little bead all along the outside edge and the top edge of these portions. And uh, and then I'll, that's when I'll place and mount these. I'll do so very carefully because that stuff is silicone and gasket maker. It's just It's just really messy gunk. And once you start getting that around, it becomes a real pain in the butt to get it off. Uh, so I'll take caution with that for sure. But yeah, I am definitely looking forward to getting these out of the way. Uh, once that's done, then I can probably light block the entire surface, the inside surface. And then I can start thinking about making compartments for these individual pieces for, uh, sorry, the BC decks here. Uh, I can start thinking about maybe fitting my uh, officer's lounge and my rec deck in there and uh, do some light tests. When I'm happy with that, then I can start mounting my actual lights in here and then fastening the window pieces on. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll be ready to move on to, I guess, the bottom of the saucer section. Make sure that's all working as well. Get that light blocked um, and then do some further testing. Make sure this is mounted away out of the crystal as well. I'll have to take care of that as as I proceed here. Um, so what I want to do right now is just go through my electronics inventory. I've been wanting to show this off. I, I wanted to uh, include this in my previous video, video, but I was already running, I think, 40, 45 minutes. I'm probably close to that even right now. But if I don't do this, I'll never do it. So maybe I'll cut this into two pieces or else we'll have an extra long video. But I do want to go through my inventory, explain some of the choices I made, why I made them and uh, just go through um, where I got most of this. So most of this came through an online parts catalog called Mauser. Uh, some of this stuff did come from my local electronics store. So like this here, this is my uh, experimental board. This came from my uh, local electronics supplier. Let me just open this bag real quick because this, this kind of fits into where I am right now and where I'm moving in the near future. So I bought a handful of these little uh, experimental boards. This is what I'm going to use rather than get circuit boards designed, which I could do. I, I have hummed and hawed. I, I thought I might go that route, but in the end I, I, I had these. They were locally accessible. They don't require me to lay down and design a circuit board. And I thought, you know what, this is this is kind of an ideal solution. I'm already tackling so many different little problems and issues that maybe this is the way I want to go. So what I bought, this is part of my parts inventory here, in order to fasten my jumper cables to my circuit boards, uh, I needed these little mounting, these little mounting solutions. And these, I, I have these here, there's I think eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, eight. Uh, they have eight jacks each, and these will mount into my circuit boards. And this is what I will wire my, uh, my jumper cables into. So the way this works is I'll put my components in through here. My resistors will go in here. My shift registers will go into here. My power in and out will go into here. And then, so they, they go in on this side. I solder them down on this side. And from there, I'll need to wire all the components together. And that's where this wire will come in handy. Uh, like I said, it has the very thin insulation. insulation. It should be very easy to work with. Um, and of course, this this is where I, these are my output jacks for plugging in my uh, jumper cables. I bought a few different kinds of these. Of course, I have some where the male end needs to come in. I have some where the female end needs to come in. These have the, the eight inputs each. Uh, and these are for my groups of eight lights. I also have some, I have a, I have a few that are three because my output from my Arduino to the shift register is three different wires. So I'll, I'll have a couple of, of uh, three slot units for that. And I have some two slot units as well for just my VCC. That's my positive and negative power supply. Um, so I did buy, I bought originally a whole handful of these because I thought, and I, I mentioned this in one of my previous videos, that I would need one shift register per group of 
eight lights. That was my initial impression that I would need to add a shift register, shift register, shift register, what, a shift register, register for each of these groups of eight lights. It turns out I don't need to do it that way. Um, you can still, you can chain these shift registers, but rather than adding them, you can multiply them. So two shift registers gives me eight by eight, and that powers 64 LEDs, and 64 LEDs is enough to run all of my, most of my lighting for these saucer sections. So the way I've calculated this out is that, um, so I've got six groups with eight lights each. That's 48 lights. So that's uh, six full rows of eight. Um, and then I have th this interior here, and this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, and then I have this, which is one, two, three, four, five. And how else did I, I added it all up. I didn't write it down, it was in my head and now I've forgotten. It turns out that 64, an eight by eight solution, which gives me 64 light outputs, was just perfect to do the saucer section, not including the fiber optic light that I was gonna run for my strobe and the bridge. That doesn't include the navigation lights around the circumference. I was gonna run those off of a, uh, a different integrated circuit. I'll get into that in a moment here. But just for the interior lighting, uh, and eight by eight is just fine. So I can use, instead of using six different or seven different shift registers or even eight and eight of these, it turns out I just need one of the larger, I could probably get away with just one of these larger uh, boards and two shift registers, multiply them in a, a strategy called multiplexing. Um, and that still allows me to control all of my LEDs independently. Uh, I can turn them all on or all off, but it saves on the amount of work I have to do. Because now instead of eight different boards scattered across and all the extra weight that that entails, I just have one circuit board that I can mount maybe centered across here and all my wiring would reach to that uh, in a nice central location so it keeps everything balanced, the weight of it balanced. And uh, and go from there. So let me just explain how that works real quick. If anybody is familiar with a spreadsheet for example, you have rows and columns. Multiplexing works with the same strategy. You have one shift register giving you your outputs for your eight rows, and then you have another shift register giving you eight for your eight columns. They multiply together, and you have 64 independently controllable light outputs. And uh, the 64 is just perfect for doing my lighting on the interior of the saucer. For testing that, I was kind of poking around in my, so this little kit here, this is the original Arduino prototyping kit that I had purchased. Um, I probably paid more for it than I needed to. I bought this at a local store. It costed 60 bucks. I've looked around online and you can get them a lot cheaper, like almost half of that. Uh, dang it. Here goes the camera. Okay. And this little thing here, this is, an eight by eight LED matrix. So it has my 16 inputs and I can plug my jumper cables into that. So this turns out to be perfect for my testing when I'm writing the actual software to operate all of this. Instead of wiring up my entire saucer, I could just use this little nifty device. And this came with the prototyping kit. I didn't even know what was in there until I started poking around with it. I had so many little things that I wasn't familiar with when I first opened the box. Now I have a grasp of what some of these things are and I was poking around and I thought, you know, that is absolutely awesome that I have one of these things. It's like they knew. I have a couple other nifty little goodies. So here's another LED light-up display. There's a four-digit display. Here's a single-digit display. And uh, another little trick that I'd like to learn how to use is is called pulse width modulation for lighting up LEDs. And what that means is rather than providing constant power to an LED, there's an LED, rather than providing constant power to it, pulse width modulation means that you're, you're pulsing your, your power to it. And that's how you end up controlling 64 different LEDs is the different pulses. 
But what that does is it, um, first of all, it limits the amount of power that, that you're consuming in lighting up your ship. But it also allows you to individually address uh, all of your, your, your lighting hardware. So I'm just, I'm gonna, I need to learn more about that uh, and figure out how it works. I haven't gotten anywhere near to testing any custom programming code. I've been using sample code in my testing, sample code that I've downloaded off the Arduino lessons and uh, other resources that people have posted. Um, because more than anything else right now, I'm testing my, uh, my hardware solution, not my software solutions. I will get to that point very quickly. Things like blinking my navigation lights and blinking my strobe is not gonna be an issue. Uh, controlling the power up sequence for all of the cabins is going to be a, not hard. I'm not going to say it's hard, but it's going to be a little bit trickier uh, because I'm still not familiar with how I address them exactly. But once I've done that, I'll, I'll, I'll clump my, my lights into arrays or groups, for example, of eight. So I'll know this is section A, for example, section B, section C. And uh, in my code, I, I can address them as that. A, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, B, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's how I can uh, individually address these lights. So I'll be getting to that pretty quick. I, I want this done and ready uh, because I want to get this work out of the way before I move on from there. And that should be certainly within the next week, I would expect to have all those compartments done and have my light blocking painted. So by next weekend, hopefully I'll have uh, some progress there. So inventory. I'm gonna try to get through this real quick. <laughs> the chances of me actually doing that are slim uh, because there's a lot here. And if I start throwing a lot of additional explanations, then I'll end up consuming a lot of time, but I'll try to do this as quickly as I possibly can. So these are my integrated circuits uh, that I ordered. We have two Atmega 328s. This is the circuit that is the heart and soul of the Arduino itself. This is where I upload my code when I've written it to the Arduino, uh, and then the code controls what's going on in the rest of the boards. When I'm finished and when I'm ready to start wiring everything together, I'm not going to encase this Arduino into my base because the Arduino was meant to be a prototyping board. It's not necessarily something I you can, I could certainly embed this into my base, but I'm not going to. I'm going to use the Arduino to program another uh, Atmega 328 chip. I'll bury that into a circuit board, and that's what's going to sit inside my uh, my base and control the the lighting in the ship. I bought two of them because I thought I I may need so many outputs that one might not be enough. But remember, this is before I started realizing that I had options like the multiplexing. That's going to save me a lot in my outputs and that I can chain my shift registers together. That was another revelation for me. So using little trick tips and tricks like that, it's going to help a lot in minimizing the devices that I need, the power that I'm consuming. So this has been a learning process, a lot of reading and experimentation. Those are my Atmega 328 chips. Okay. So moving on, there are two missing out of this. These are my shift registers. These are the 748C595s. I just call them 595s for short. Um, I was already playing around with two of them in my breadboard, uh, along with a bunch of resistors and stuff. Um, I did originally buy 10 of these. So there's a group of five, because I thought I was going to need that many. When I, when I had first decided I was going to chain them all together in an, uh, in an addition format, I thought I would need certainly at least eight of them and then probably more for the rest of the ship. Turns out using the, the multiplexing, I may not need so many, but I'm sure I can find other uses for them because I, I, I like building things anyway, <laughs> so they'll get used. These are AT Tinies, AT Tiny 85, 86 is it? Something like that. AT Tiny 86 maybe? No, I think they're 85s. Anyway, these are teeny, teeny little versions of this. In other words, I can, I can upload code to them. They have less outputs, but they do have a timer. Uh, I think they may even have two timers in them. Uh, I've, I don't know that they can be chained together. So these are standalone, uh, but what these can be used for is controlling all my flashing. So that's probably what I'm gonna do for controlling my flashing. I don't need necessarily to chain the output from the Arduino 
to this. This can run as a standalone. I can power, I can certainly program this using my uh, Atmega 328s. And once they're programmed, I can build a little circuit board where they're standalone, run a power into it, and then the outputs can control my navigation lights, my blinking, and the flashing of the strobes. I bought 10 of them. I don't think I'm going to need anywhere near 10 of them. One, certainly. Two, maybe. That depends on whether it actually does have two timers that are capable of doing the strobe and the navigation lights independently. If I decided to go the route of flickering or flashing my thrusters to give an effect of motion, uh, that's where I could use one of these as well. An AT Tiny would be perfect for that. Um, so yeah, those are my integrated circuits. I have an additional power supply. Right now, the experiment that I demonstrated earlier, I'm, I'm using a, a five volt, two amp power supply for that. Uh, I had thought that if I'm running this many lights, because there's quite a few, there's at least 120 different lights and, and depending on whatever, whatever else I throw in here, I may certainly cross the two amp threshold. So I went out and bought a five volt, five amp power supply as well. This is a switching power supply. Uh, whether or not I need this remains to be seen. If I can avoid it, I will, because the switching power supplies do generate a bit of that, that high-pitched whine that you hear uh, electronic circuits make, some, make sometimes. So we'll see whether I need that or not. If not, I mean, it's there. I can experiment with it. What we have here, these are, um, these are more of my plugs, my jacks for mounting to my circuit boards and mounting my uh, jumper cables to. I bought a variety of them. These are the male ends, the ones I showed you before are the female ends. This is my length of fiber optic. I have five meters of it. I think that's more than enough. Um, but yeah, this is what I'm gonna use to run my strobes at least. And we'll see what else I may, I may find other uses for this as well. Next, we have, uh, these are called trimmer resistors. What I'd like to use these for is, I've just, I'm running everything at nominal power off of a five volt power system I calculated the necessary resistance I needed on all of my LEDs. And like I said earlier, they came to mostly 100 ohm resistors. That may in the end end up being too bright. Uh, so trimmer resistors will come in handy just to run in my circuit and be able to dial down some of the values if I wanted to. Same with the rate of my flashing. I could use trimmer resistors just to adjust, slightly adjust uh, those values so that it's in a place that I'm happy with them. And I thought it'd be fun also that when I create my base, it'd be fun to have a little compartment that you can break down and, you know, like they do in an engineering station on, uh, on the Enterprise when something blows up, they have to open up the compartment and, and go in and tweak some things. So I thought it'd be fun to have that kind of ability as well, even if it's just something minor. And what do we have here? We have more of my, so these are my triples and my doubles. This is for running my these are jacks again. These are for running my uh, power supply and my output source from the Arduino into my circuit boards. We have, what is this? This is another, oh, these are uh, dip, dip sockets for my uh, integrated circuits. I have a few varieties of these. I have a couple for my AT tinies. I have a couple for my shift registers, and I have one, I think, for my uh, at megas. Okay, so now we're starting to get into the LEDs. This is the fun part. So what we have here are 15 RGB LEDs. And what these might, these may not get used. I have the resistors that go with these as well. The idea behind these, let me just dump this out, is to mount maybe 12 of them in some fashion on the inside of my deflector dish to give me a ring of inside glow for my deflector dish. So I would have my middle bulb coming up with my RGB there, but also possibly a ring of RGBs along the outside edge. That could end up being too bright. It could end up being just really difficult to mount. And in the end, I probably won't go that route, but I decided I, I wanted to have them just to play around with anyway. So I've got my RGBs for that. Those are little SMDs. Um, 
So they are pretty small, but still, you know, 12 of them is, is pretty significant. And that's a fairly tight space. I'm not sure how I would go about mounting them, either between this and the uh, solid plastic piece that this sits in, or maybe cutting little gaps in that solid plastic piece so that I can mount those little SMDs and uh, maybe get the light out of there. Again, I don't even know how to begin to re reproach that. What I want to do is, is get the SMD bulb, the RGB bulb, in the center first and just see what kind of an effect I can achieve out of that. And I'll go from there. So we have resistors for those 15. I have three each because the trick is with these RGBs. Now they're pretty, so these SMDs are really teeny. And the ones that I'm working with so far, these are just simply white. Uh, so they have an anode and a cathode. The anode, by the way, is where your negative mounts to. Your cathode is where your positive mounts to. The way, the trick that I've taught myself to remember that is that when you prefix a word with a or a, that tends to mean the opposite of or the negative of. Like we have uh, sexual and asexual as being asexual being the opposite. We have a node, we have an a, a cathode, and we have an anode, and that's just a little means that I use to remember which which of the two is which. These, however, have three cathodes and one anode, which means on an SMD that size, I have not two, but four uh, parts that I need to solder my wiring onto. And that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. So there's another reason not to use these if I don't have to. However, if it provides a better effect, I may decide to go that route. Either way, I have them in my inventory just in case. So these next four, these are my RGB bulbs. These are through holes, they're five millimeters. Two of them are clear, two of them are frosted. And in the data sheets, they were all slightly different in their specs. So that's why I bought it. They were relatively inexpensive. That's why I bought all four. I got two each. Uh, one would be for the deflector dish, and one would be for the, the crystal on the top of the saucer section, for whichever one I decided to go with. Um, I haven't opened these yet. I will uh, eventually and, and just play around with them and see what kind of effects. I imagine I could probably get the exact same light out of all of them. It's just the means by which I get that, that light, that color, that hue would be slightly different for each. But anyway, I got all four. RGBs are fun. I imagine they'll get used either way. So what we have here, these are my 133. So let's get this and my 513s and my 233s because these are my three variants. Which one are these? Those are my purples. These are greens. Okay, so there's my 233s and that. This is, oh yeah, okay. I'm missing a pack. I'll probably have it out somewhere because I'm working with it. 233s. Anyway, this, this is fine for illustration. So these are my three different variants of, um, of warm white SMDs that I'm using for the interior as, as I described in one of my earlier videos. The 133 is the neutral. The 233 is the warm, and somewhere around here I have my 513s, which is my very cool white. And like I said earlier, these are these are all still warm white uh, on the spectrum, but the three different varieties of that warmth is what I was looking for. And they're, they're not significantly different in temperature, but enough that they would stand out against each other. And I think that'll give me, like I said before, a really nice effect seeing different shades of light coming out from different sections of the ship. Uh, these are really tough to, to solder. I do have my helping hands. I find the magnifying glass on them is a bit of a nuisance. I don't like the magnifying glass, but I like the uh, alligator clips. They do help a lot. Now beyond that, I have uh, my purples. I bought a couple of purple through hole five millimeters. I'll play around with those. They probably won't get used. I imagine these are gonna be way too purple for the inside of the nacelles, but I like purple, so I'm gonna light them up just for the sake of lighting them up. Um, these are white through holes. So these are my floods. I've got quite a few of them. These are three millimeters, and these are for 
achieving my floodlight effects. How many did I buy? 25 of them. Should be more than enough. Here I have my resistors. These are, oh, I bought a whack of these. I bought 200 and then I bought 100 more. <laughs> so I've got 300 of these 100 ohm resistors in all. In fact, the only time when I performed my calculations uh, that I didn't need 100 ohm resistors was for, for those RGB LEDs. The red needed 180 ohm resistors, whereas the G and the B each needed the 100 ohm resistors. So that's why I have these three different packages, 15 of each. Two of the packages are 100 ohms, and then one package is the 180 ohm resistors. So yeah, that's, that's my electronics inventory. I had a lot of fun putting this together. I, like I said, I spent a whole weekend doing this. I'd never read a data sheet before. I became a pretty proficient at it. Um, I won't say I enjoyed it, <laughs> but, but it was necessary and I, and I did read through them and I kept copies of all of them too so I can uh, reference them. In fact, I've got a nice little organized spreadsheet where I track all of these parts uh, the URL of the web page that I bought them from, just in case I ever needed to buy more, I can just quickly reference them. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, this video has become very long. I'm just going to end it abruptly. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. Have yourself a good day. Take care. Bye for now.